Hello and welcome to a new episode of Nile Magazine in which we bring to you a lot of interesting topics. So stay with us. The first segment is Story of the Week and in it I'll be interviewing international guitarist Ahmed Hamdi who'll talk to us about his story of success. It will be followed by the Eye of Horus and in it we will be heading to the Egyptian Museum of Antiquities to look at artifacts discovered by the area of the New Suez Canal Zone. As for the science page, in it Dr. Yasser Mohammed Cheker, professor of medicinal organic chemistry, will talk to us about his latest research. Finally, in the cultural review, we will be reviewing some of the activities and events which took place as part of the Casablanca International Documentary and Short Film Festival. time for story of the week. Today's story of the week is special because in today's story of the week we will be meeting with one of the world's best classical guitarists. Today I'm happy to have with me celebrity guitarist Ahmed Hamdi. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to start by asking you, when did you uh, start or decide to study uh, music? Well, uh, I decided to uh, learn in guitar uh, in uh, 1982. Uh, it was the second year to me in uh, a military college, and I uh, took a great decision, a dangerous decision to leave this career and start my music career. I started at uh, the Italian Institute in Cairo with the great legend maestro Maurice Caruso. Allah Hamo. He was a great guitarist living here in Egypt and he taught me everything. He taught me how to play guitar, how to read music, how to compose music, harmony, everything about music. Now doctor, uh, would you talk to us about of the types of uh, music which can be played on the guitar? Uh, uh, we have many, uh, many music periods, mm -hmm. uh, starting with the Renaissance period, uh, going to the uh, Baroque, then Classic period, Romantic, Modern, and uh, guitar uh, uh, start to appear in the Classic period. We have many uh, great composers. Uh, wrote many compositions for guitar, like uh, Maurice Caruso, like, uh, of course, he's my, uh, my teacher and my uh, godfather of the guitar. And also, uh, we have um, Mario Giuliani from Italy and uh, uh, Fernando Carulli. Uh, many composers um, uh, uh, formed and uh, constructed many uh, methods to learn how to play guitar with the finger style. And of course, we can't forget Fernando Sor, the legend of uh, uh, classic period in guitar uh, from Spain. And uh, we, I want to uh, 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 yes. uh, uh, tell uh, my audience about uh, how Beethoven mentioned him. Uh, he, he said that Fernando Sor is the Beethoven of the guitar. Uh, in this time, uh, student was learning from these methods. Mm -hmm. Caralli, uh, Matteo, Matteo Carcassi, uh, Fernando Sor. Uh, but now it's different. 
uh, 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 students can't uh, uh, go with the, these uh, methods because it's very difficult and we have to learn uh, many of uh, things like uh, harmony, like uh, theory of music and uh, uh, reading music before learning how to play guitar. So uh, uh, finally I constructed my two most academic important academic um, uh, music schools in uh, Egypt, one of them at uh, the American University in Cairo and the other one at Cairo Opera House. Uh, it started both in 2007. Uh, and I uh, put my, uh, uh, my intelligence in this career to uh, form a new method to uh, to be suitable for the Egyptian student uh, who comes uh, from scratch, can't read, can't, uh, can't even hear uh, the, this, these kinds of music. Uh, ah, that's all. Now, between uh, the time when you graduated from uh, the School of Music and learning after learning how to play the guitar, up to the time you formed your personal school now. What happened next? When was your first real concert? First real concert, I, I started um, performing guitar solo uh, from 1986, before Cairo Prowse mm -hmm. was built. And uh, in, in many uh, places like uh, 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 schools or uh, uh, Culture values. values, yeah. Uh, but uh, the most important concert was in 1988 mm -hmm. in Gumriya Theater. Mm -hmm. Was a concerto for guitar and orchestra conducted by the great conductor Yusuf Sisi Al Arhamu, and it was the first time mm -hmm. to Egypt and to the Cairo uh, Symphony Orchestra to uh, 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 performing with uh, guitar mm -hmm. as a soloist. that actually that, that was the first time for the Cairo Opera House or the Cairo Symphonic Orchestra to perform with a guitar. Now, what was the, the reaction of the audience? The audience, musicians, even uh, uh, writers uh, was surprised to uh, uh, hearing about a concert for guitar and orchestra. It was the first time, uh, and uh, uh, you know, a guitar uh, has weak sound, and to play with orchestra, uh, it was very strange. Uh, uh, but uh, it was it was the uh, the first time. But I, uh, I repeated it v many times because it was very successful. Uh, in uh, 2007, in Main Hall, Cairo Opera House, I performed. Uh, the most famous and most acclaimed guitar concerto ever written in the 20th century by the great Spanish composer uh, Joaquin Rodrigo. It has the, uh, the main theme in uh, the second movement, well, very well known by the title Mon Amour, uh, by the, uh, conducted by the Swiss conductor uh, Maestro Thomas Herzog, and it was very successful also, thanks God. Uh, and uh, I performed another uh, composition by the, by the same composer, uh, Joaquin Rodrigo, uh, in uh, 2010. 
conducted by the uh, German maestro Ernst Schiller. Before the interview, you told me that there is a difference when I asked you about the classic guitar and, the, and you told me the classical period is totally different from when you say Spanish music, it, that Spanish music is a term and the idea of classical or the periods of music is totally, di or even the genres of music is totally different thing. So would you explain that please? Uh, well, guitar is a purely Spanish uh, instrument. Mm -hmm. uh, it's generated by the uh, uh, guitar constructor. Uh, I, I, I can't remember his name. But uh, it's uh, in Spain, we have uh, a very popular uh, 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 instrument called vehuela. He adds something to the instrument to be like this. Uh, I, I remember his name. His name is Antonio Torres. Okay, but it is not the real name of this instrument. The guitar is the name of an instrument uh, constructed by a German uh, a music instrument con uh, constructor, and he took the name uh, to the new instrument, and uh, he made it uh, to look like the uh, body of uh, the Spanish uh, dancer. Yeah look like the body of a Spanish dancer, okay? And we add to uh, the Spanish guitar. We can play classical music on the Spanish guitar because uh, we, sp we play the Spanish guitar by the finger, by the fingers. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very rich, like piano. We occur many sounds from the instrument at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we can play classical music, that's why we uh, name it classical guitar because it can play both classical music and Spanish music. Now let's listen to some of Ahmed Hamdi's music accompanied by conductor and percussionist Mr. Ayman Sidi. <laughs>
Club International guitarist Taimat Hamdi. Thank you very much for this interview. But we will be continuing in our next episode in our first segment of Story of the Week with you, continuing to know more about you and your story of success. Thank you. time for the Eye of Horus. Today we're coming to you from the Egyptian Museum of Antiquities where we will be looking into a special exhibition dedicated to the finds which were discovered close to the Suez Canal and its area. Right now, as you can see, we are in the exhibition of some of the artifacts which were discovered on the banks and close to the area of the Suez Canal. One of these areas is the area of Tel El Hir. Actually, if we look at the chart here, actually it was a mega fortress. It dates to the Ptolemaic and Roman era. We can see uh, the uh, remain of some houses. We can see also fortresses. This is the chart of a Roman camp dating to the Roman era as well. Some of the pieces which came out of it uh, here, we can see statues of some of the gods like Isis and uh, Osiris. Isis is the lady with the wing and Osiris is the god in the mummy form and some of uh, the amulatic form in uh, copper. On the other side we have one of uh, the uh, stelas as well and these stelas usually either were boundary stelas or they were stelas for uh, the victories of the kings at that time where they stated that they went out of Egypt from the northeastern side of Egypt to conquer other countries, especially in the area of Iraq, Syria and Palestine. This beautiful limestone stella was found in the excavations of Tel El Habwa, uh, the second site of it, and it represents King Ramses I, the founder of the 19th dynasty and the grandfather of Ramses II, giving offering to the god Seth. Although the god Seth was considered the god of evil, but yet he was the protector of the de desert area and the area of the Sinai, and here the king is giving him offerings, and we can see that the god is holding the symbol of prosperity, and he's wearing the double crown of Egypt. Another important king is King Tutmosis III of the 18th dynasty. King Tutmosis III was an important warrior king who led more than 16 campaigns to the north of uh, Egypt. Actually, uh, the beginning of his reign was actually, he was just courageous with his uh, aunt, mother-in-law and stepmother, Queen Hatshepsut. But then, once after 21 years of Hatshepsut ruling, he managed to ascend the throne. So Moses III decided to excel and surpass her. She was good in construction and the domestic affairs. He became the best and most um, excelling uh, pharaoh concerning the military activities and the best warrior, one of the best warrior kings Egypt ever had known. This is a statue of the king. He's wearing the shindit, which is uh, the uh, royal uh, skirt. We can see a straight beard, meaning that the king is depicted as a ruler. We have one hand flat, the other is holding a, a handkerchief to symbolize an emblem of power. And he is wearing also the nemes headdress, which is uh, the royal headdress with the cobra on the forehead. Beneath his feet, we can see several bows. These bows are symbol of the enemies, the symbol of nine tribes of enemies in ancient times and here it's to say that all the enemies of Egypt are subjugated under the king's feet. For the piece in front of me here, this is actually a limestone stele. It dates to the 26th dynasty, around almost more or less uh, 
600 BC. It dates to the time of Basmaticus the first Wah Ibra. This slab of stone was discovered in Tel Dafna. This is here a chart showing the area of Tel Dafna, which lies nine kilometers southwest of the Suez Canal on the Paleolithic uh, branch of the River Nile. Actually, it was a big fortress, and also it has a palace of the king. This was discovered in the palace of the king, and that's the image of it. That's a map of uh, the plan of Tel Dafna and the area itself. Here we can see also some of uh, the images of the location where this slab of stone was discovered. And it mentions here on the stone in hieroglyphics how uh, Pasmaticus used that gateway, the eastern gateway of Egypt, to head out on his campaign in the area of uh, uh, what we call the Levant or uh, the uh, area of uh, actually Syria, Palestine and Iraq right now. The showcase beside me here, this belongs to uh, actually a variety of eras, mainly New Kingdom. We have uh, the head of uh, Queen T. Queen T was the wife of King Amenhotep III and the mother of Akhenaten. And uh, that was found in the area of Tal al -Maskhuta. Then, at, oh, excuse me, Sarabit al -Khadim. Then we have some of the jewelry and necklaces, and these actually were found in uh, other sites the, in the areas of the mines. And if we look at them, we can see the details, the beautiful details of uh, the various amuletic forms of the various gods and amulets of ancient Egypt. Discoveries by the area of the Suez Canal took place in more than 10 sites. The, we have uh, a lot of boards here telling us the name of these sites. Uh, the way itself or the road of uh, the Egyptian army stepping out of Egypt was called the road of Horus. Horus as the god symbolizing the ruling king and the protector of Egypt. So he was the god to protect the army and the military campaigns. Of course, in addition to other gods like the god Amun-Ra and many of the other gods of Egypt, but the road itself was called the road of Horus. Now, in one of these sites, we discovered this beautiful head. It belongs to the king uh, Sen Usrid, the third of the 12th dynasty, was an important king. Actually, this king was the first to think of connecting uh, the river Nile with uh, the Red Sea and uh, for the all of the one of the oldest projects which later on came became the Suez Canal but instead of uh, the Nile with the Red Sea it's the Red Sea with the Mediterranean now we found this beautiful head for him in the areas of uh, close to uh, Suez or the Suez Canal and we also found stamps dating to other kings like Ptolemaeus and Nikau and uh, Nikau was from the late period while uh, Ptolemaeus of course was from the Greek era and it tells us how these kings were one of the first to try committing or trying to connect the river Nile with the Red Sea area. Beside me here, this is an anthropoid coffin of King Ahmoses or Amazes the first. Actually, Amazes he was the founder of the new kingdom because we have in Egypt what we call the old kingdom, for first the archaic period, and old, middle, new, and late kingdoms. These were periods of glory. Between each period and the other lay almost 150 to 200 years of decline. Now we had the old kingdom. And then a period of decline occurred, then the Middle Kingdom. Following the Middle Kingdom, another period of decline occurred, but then kings from Luxor, and it was the father of actually Amazes and his brother, and then finally Amazes or Ahmose, as we call him, the first, managed to unite Egypt again and expel the invaders of Egypt, whom we call the Hyksos. Now, to expel them out of Egypt, he had to expel them back to where they came from, which was the northeast. So he had to pass through Sinai to do that. So this is a sarcophagus of him. It was found and discovered in the area of Luxor. If we look at the characteristic features of an anthropoid coffin, it takes the mummy form, which is the shape of the god Osiris. We can see uh, the beautiful hair wig, the color, the turned up beard, which means that is depicted as uh, the god Osiris as a divinity. This 
granite masterpiece belongs to the 19th dynasty, actually to the time of King Ramses II. This is a statue of the god Horus. Horus was symbol of everything that's good and right. And he was one of uh, the main triad of the country, which is Isis, Osiris, and Horus. Isis, the symbol of motherhood, the ruling mother, the symbol of the throne, and magic and protection. Osiris, the god of the afterlife, and Horus was symbol of everything that's good and the manifestation of the living king. Now, if we look at it, he's wearing the double crown of Egypt, the cobra on the forehead, a hair wig, and he's in the human form because the gods of Egypt could take the, an animal form or a human form. The Ankh sign, which is the key of life because he's a god, he's a life giving. Then we have the cartouches and the names of the god Rams, uh, excuse me, the king Ramses II. And as I mentioned earlier, every king will have two names. We can see here his main name, which is Usar uh, Ma'at Ra Setepen Ra, and that's uh, his uh, coronation name. Then on the sides, we have uh, the other names, which is Ra Meses or Ramses. And this Ramses II was important because he was one of the most important pharaohs of the 19th dynasty who led campaigns. He uh, actually also to him we attribute uh, the famous battle of Qadesh against the Hittites. for the science page. It's time to meet with Dr. Yasser Mohammed Shakir, Professor of uh, Medicinal Organic Chemistry, who will talk to us about his latest research. Well, first of all, would you please define to us what is medicinal organic chemistry? Okay. Uh, first of all, medicinal organic chemistry. I will speak about organic chemistry first, and I will uh, make the relation with medicinal chemistry. Organic chemistry is the chemistry uh, of carbon and hydrogen. If you find carbon atom and hydrogen atom in the molecule, this means that we deal with organic chemistry. Uh, if the compound, the final target compound, uh, have medicinal application in, in treatment of any disease and so on, this means it will be medicinal organic chemistry. Now, you're using novel compounds in medicinal application. First of all, I'd like to know what's the definition or the meaning of novel compounds? Yes. Um, any compound have uh, have uh, abnormal structure or or n very new structure and have medicinal application uh, in uh, in in very novel field. This means that it, it is novel compound. Uh, for example, uh, I, when I was in Trinity College and I have my PhD from Trinity College Dublin from in Ireland, um, I prepare uh, borfren new borfren novel borfren compound for application in photodynamic therapy for treatment of cancer. Uh, Borfarin are novel compound. Why? Because it have abnormal, uh, uh, highly conjugated electronic structure. Highly conjugated electronic structure, this can uh, have the ability to absorb laser light. When uh, laser light is already uh, go to uh, absorb it by the borfarin, borfarin can excite it to higher energy level. When the borfarin uh, because it is a highly conjugated system, can absorb light in higher wavelengths, and in this case, it will be excited to higher energy level. This, uh, in this case, it will be have excess energy, so it can make energy transfer to another molecule in the excited, uh, in, the, uh, in the same electronic state. Uh, this means that it can be applied in the field of photodynamic therapy, uh, and this is very important for cancer treatment. This is new, uh, new. Uh, type of treatment of cancer, not phototherapy, not chemotherapy, but photodynamic therapy. Dr. Yasser Mohammed Shaker, Professor of Medicinal Organic Chemistry, thank you very much for this interview. Thank you so much for this opportunity to explain my research interest.
The Casablanca International Documentary and Short Film Festival was recently held in Morocco. Now let's look at some of its events and activities. The 10th round of the Casablanca Short and Documentary Film Festival was recently held in Morocco. More than 30 short and documentary films from Morocco, Egypt, Lebanon, Iraq, Tunisia, France, and Brazil competed as part of the festival's main competition. The inauguration ceremony started by introducing the festival's guests of honor and members of the jury to the public. We are holding a lot of cultural activities as part of the agenda of the 10th round of the Casablanca Short and Documentary Film Festival. We will also be honoring Egyptian actor Mustafa Shaban, Moroccan actress Amina Rashid, and producer Mohamed Derid. Festival is under the slogan the role of cinema in the unity of the land and the development of the southern states. The films competing were chosen based on their quality. The festival has become more popular and gained more fame. I would like to thank all the media and the personnel who helped in making this event possible. The inauguration ceremony of the five-day festival was marked by awarding leading Arab cinematographers and actors, including leading Moroccan actress Amina Rashid. The award was given to her by Moroccan actress Magida bin Kiryan. Also celebrity Egyptian actor Mustafa Shaban was honored. The award was given to him by director of the festival Mohamed Mushtari, who praised Mustafa Shaban's choice of characters. I'm happy to be here. I'm impressed by the way I was met by the Moroccans. I'm honored to be honored in this beautiful country. Morocco is so beautiful. It is quite impressive how the festival screen is set in the middle of the square. This is my fourth visit to Morocco. The Moroccan people are warm and friendly. They are also known for their love for Egyptians. I'm happy to be honored for my roles. The ceremony included a variety of shows, including a performance by Moroccan singer Julia, who sang and danced to the Lebanese Dabka rhythms. On the second day of the festival, actor Mustafa Shaban held a three-hour symposium in which he discussed the various aspects of his career with the public. The festival continued to dazzle both Moroccans and Arabs. On the third day of the festival, the Egyptian film Masraya, Egyptian, was screened, starring Mafa El Hakim and directed by Shadi El Hakim. I'm honored to be awarded for my life achievements as part of the Casablanca Short and Documentary Film Festival. I'm happy to be present among the Moroccan people. This festival is unique as it's held on the streets of Morocco. The ceremony stage is set in one of Casablanca's main squares. I'm thrilled that the cinema is being introduced to the public. If you look at the audience, they are mainly youth. Cinema should be directed to youth. I'm glad that my film, Masraya, will be screened to all these youth. The film is directed by Shadi Al Hakim. I hope it is successful and appreciated. I wish for the Egyptian art to spread throughout the world and to be present in every street and every alley worldwide. <laughs> وكنت عايزة أقابلها بخصوص إن ألو ألو أنا بعمل بحث عن المرأة والمجتمع كنت عايزة أكلم أي حد بس يكون عنده حالة من حالات في ال... ألو ألو
اهلا يا فوفا انا لابسه اهو مستنياكي بقالي ساعه ايه الشياكه دي كلها؟ بين ذا دايركتور اوف فيلم مصريه بارتيسيبنت ان ذيس فيستيفال كازابلانكا فور شورت فيلم اند دوكيومنتري اند اي ام اونر تو تو بارتيسيبيت ان ذا اوفيشال كومبيتيشن اند ذيس از ماي 15th فيستيفال تو بارتيسيبيت ان افتر تو وينينج اوردز اند ذا موفي ويل بي شون تو ديسكاس ا لوت اوف ايشوز اباوت Women's status and women's freedom in Egypt, and uh, hopefully it will be uh, good for the Moroccan community and to be an add-on for the festival. Also, the Moroccan film Al Khan's The Treasure was screened. The film is directed by Lubna Ayed. <laughs> My film tackles an Arab issue, the life in the Moroccan desert throughout the ages. In the film, I use the child to symbolize the future of Morocco. He is taught how to appreciate the value of the desert and Morocco. I'm glad that the festival's members of the jury had liked my film. The film has been previously awarded Best Script in Morocco. I worked hard, did a lot of researches, visited the Moroccan desert and talked to its residents before I started shooting the film. The 10th Casablanca Short and Documentary Film Festival is unique in its aspects, including being held in the streets of Casablanca with huge screens set in the main squares of the city, allowing the average Moroccan and passerby to enjoy the film screens and many of the festival's activities. The 10th round of the Casablanca Short and Documentary Film Festival was marked by press conference held by poet and head of Miss Arab Contest, Dr. Hanan Nas, announcing the date and the conditions of the 2016 round of the Beauty Contest. <laughs> Today I announced the date and conditions of the unique contest. Today I announced the date of Miss Morocco and the Arab Beauty Contest. The conference was held as part of the activities of the film festival headed by director Mohamed Mushtari. Today we discussed the various aspects of the Moroccan competition and we have announced the various categories and the dates of the contest. As for the main competition, which is Miss Arab Contest, this year many new activities will be added to it. Also, each country will have a representative who will hold local competitions to choose their country's runner-ups, who will join the main competition in Egypt. The ladies competing have to be between 17 to 27 years of age. They have to have acquired a university or academic degree, intellectual, knowledgeable, well-mannered, disciplined, interested in public and community service, and wants to represent their country. Veiled ladies can apply. During the conference, which was attended by 2015 Miss Arab Queen, the Tunisian Yasmin Dakoumi, Dr. Hanan Nasr reviewed the history of the contest and answered questions of the public about the competition. I am Yasmin Dakoumi, 22 years old, from Tunisia. Uh, actually, I am Miss Arab World 2015. Um, I heard about the competition through my mother. She heard about the casting who, uh, who was held, held in uh, Tunis and she called me and she told me I want you to participate. So that's what I did and uh, alhamdulillah I, I got through the, the most hard uh, uh, steps and here I am today. Um, the preparation was mainly uh, cultural and psychological because as I heard about the competition, it does not take into account the physical appearance as much as it takes into account uh, the, the culture of the girl, how she can speak, how she can present her country. So um, the preparation for me was uh, based on that criteria. The aim of the contest is to choose a lady who possesses the fine qualities of an Arab woman from ethics, 
general knowledge, language skills, elegance, finesse, and appearance, regardless of being veiled or not. <laughs> By this we come to an end of this episode of Nile Magazine. Until we meet